Building Better Athletes Elite Performance Podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Jacob Ricketts from Northern Illinois University. Jacob is a young strength coach who's had stops at Montana State, Stanford University, and now at Northern Illinois University. He is a young and upcoming strength coach uh, who has really, really just dives into the science and application of strength and conditioning and really kind of a, a nerd, if you will, in the world of strength and conditioning in terms of knowing coaches, moves, everything. He's just immersed with the world of strength and conditioning. So we hope you enjoy the podcast today. As always, please give us a follow on Twitter or Instagram at BBA Performance and like and share on this on any social media uh, if you take some takeaways from Jacob and make sure to thank him for doing a good job. So without any further ado, let's get to Jacob. All right, so welcome to the Elite Performance Podcast from Building Better Athletes. And today we got Jacob Ricketts from Northern Illinois University with us. Jacob, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yes. So give us a little background about your journey of where you are today. What kind of path did you take to get here? So uh, I went to University of Dubuque, did my undergrad, um, played football for a couple of seasons, and then I knew that I wanted to get into coaching when I went to college. And once I had gotten to school and gotten a little education under my belt, decided that strength conditioning was the route I wanted to, to take. And so uh, I went to the NSCA National Conference in Indianapolis with you and another friend of ours and um, really enjoyed the, the time there and learned a lot and started volunteering with you um, for the remainder of college. So that was my sophomore year. And the summer of my sophomore year, I went out to Montana State and did an internship there for the summer, working with football and men's basketball and volleyball. And then uh, my junior year, continued to volunteer with you. In the summer after my junior year, I went to Stanford and did an internship out there, working primarily with football during the summer. And I was supposed to be there through bowl season, but at the conference in Indianapolis, I had made some connections with the staff at Northern Illinois. And they called me in August and had a position available. So I took a paid internship position at NIU, close to my hometown, and then um, finished up my undergraduate, undergraduate degree in December, and I'm now a graduate assistant on the strength and conditioning staff at NIU. Awesome. How, how was your Stanford experience? Tell us a little bit about it with, with Turley being, he was kind of national coach of the year, college coach of the year a couple of times, and he does some really interesting things. How was that experience up there with, with Stanford and those group of athletes? It was awesome. Um, definitely a culture that they have there that I don't think you can mimic at very many other places in the country. Um, you know, very high quality people there and high quality athletes. And so their, their culture in the weight room was awesome. It was very intense. Um, attention to detail was extreme. You know, they were, they were picking apart every little thing that you were doing, making sure that it was all perfect. Your posture was in a good position and you were ready to go. And, um, you know, they have one of the lowest injury rates in the country, and it, it makes sense as to why. They do everything with a specific reason. Um, you know, they're known for nowadays, some people would consider non-traditional training, but they do a lot of body weight movements, um, a lot of single leg kind of things, a lot of activation things before the lift, but they still do your basic power cleans and your squats and your bench and whatnot. Um, but it was a very cool experience working for coach Traley and the rest of his staff yeah good and you said their internship process process was a little different right that you guys uh kind of got ranked and you got to choose your sports how'd that work yeah so when we started i think there was eight of us maybe um and we got out there and the first two weeks was all like a learning curve but they would quiz us on every single thing that we did so you know if we set up the lift that day then probably that afternoon or the next morning, they'd quiz us on that process and everything was graded. And then after that two weeks, um, we were graded and ranked. And they also had graded us on our resume and our interviews and stuff that we had done to get the positions. So then we were ranked um, as to how we scored. And then from there, we got to choose our sports. So I think it was top three or four at the beginning of summer, got to choose their first sports and you know football was typically the first one off the board and then the rest got sent to the olympic weight room and got to choose their sports in there and then right at the beginning of august the same thing happened based on performances throughout the summer so throughout the summer we continued to get graded on uh, different things that we did throughout the day and then we kind of started to get more into programming 
and how they go about their programming. We get quizzed and graded on that. And then it's just continued to build up. And throughout the entire six month process, you get ranked and get to choose your teams throughout different periods of, of time. Uh, that's an interesting process. Yeah. And it, it builds off the culture that they have with their athletes. You know, they, they're competing at all times. Yeah. And so it was, it was a cool idea. Yeah. That'd be like a, a dream job. I think for a lot of coaches is work with those type of athletes that are getting accepted to Stanford are probably some intelligent, you know, just good kids that work hard and stuff like that. So tell us, a little, bit, tell us a little about who you're working with now, what teams, um, and some of the challenges that are going in, maybe different from say Montana state or Stanford and what you're seeing at, at Northern Illinois. So, uh, my two teams that I do all the programming for are men's and women's tennis. And then I'm one of the five that assists with football. And then from there, I'm just kind of a utility guy. I'll help out with some women's basketball, I'll help out with some baseball, wrestling, et cetera. Um, so I'd never worked with tennis before. So that was new for me and was able to do a little research and, and figure out what I thought was best. Obviously worked with football at both Montana State and Stanford. And so um, challenges men's and women's tennis, you know, I have a lot of foreigners. And so there's that cultural, cultural barrier, which I found really wasn't that difficult to, um, to overcome, you know, which has been good. But then tennis, you know, they're not just big power lifters or anything like that. They don't spend a lot of time in the weight room typically. And so getting them adjusted to the weight room and adjusted to the movements and uh, technically sound was a task at first. But I think we've since come a long ways. And I was lucky enough that this year my entire men's team came back and we only had one freshman. And my women's team, we have four freshmen. So I've got opposite ends of the spectrum. My men's team, I was able to kind of jump right into things again this fall. My women's team, I had to pull back a little bit and um, really take step-by-step -step approach with my new girls. Yes. Now, you said in football, you guys have five assistant coaches. We've talked about this in the past, but you know, something I found interesting all the time is how, at football, at Division One level, how the staffs are broken up. Uh, can you kind of describe how you guys break up your staff up there with five coaches? Are you going with different groups of, say, skill, bigs, power, or different age groups, freshmen through senior? Are they in different programs? How, how do you guys break up those five coaches and their kind of roles and responsibilities within your staff? So we're kind of uh, in, in between a rock and a hard spot because we only have the weight room, but it's a large weight room, you know, 12,000 square feet. We have 27 racks. So it's, it's big enough that we can fit multiple teams in at a time. But then, and we have to. Then we run into a, you know, if we have a football lift at 6, 7, and 8 in the morning, well, I'll have women's tennis at 6.30 and another assistant will have baseball at 7.15. And so we've got to take care of our primary teams while we assist with football. And so very rarely are all five of us working with football at the same time. Um, so it's pretty free-flowing, I guess you say. We don't each have a position group or anything like that. But there are times when all of us are on, um, on the floor of football and we'll take our section of racks and, you know, you coach up those guys primarily. But then we also try and build – there's just certain kids, you know, that you relate to a little bit better or that uh, trend towards you more than other coaches. So you kind of take them on your wing and, and talk nutrition with them or talk work ethic or, you know, if one has a bad day and he's one of my guys, then I'm going to be the one that has to go approach him yep. and uh, figure out what's going on. And so that part is enjoyable. But um, if all five of us were strictly with football all the time, then I think we'd certainly be able to be more efficient as to how we break things up between us. Yeah. You touched upon a couple of things. Um, one thing I like to talk to all of our interns and young coaches is some of the challenges that they don't realize what happens at levels. And I talk about a lot in the private sector because that's kind of my main business is kind of the challenges that go into opening or running a sports performance facility. But also, in, the, in your guys' in your position, you talked about you help with football, but your primary sport might be there at the same time. So you're like you said, you're trying to handle two responsibilities or two teams at the same time. What are some other challenges um, that uh, maybe are unknown before you got into kind of this situation that are kind of eye openers or that young coaches should realize going into a, a college environment where hey, it's not, it's not going to be so simple as what you thought in school. There's a lot of challenges that you have to uh, overcome or kind of work within those constraints. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how 
handcuffed you truly are by your head coach. Yep. Um, we're lucky we've got a lot of head coaches at NIU, and, and we have pretty good working relationships. And so we're able to, um, you know, compromise on how we go about things in the weight room. But if a coach says, you know, this meet this weekend is really important, we're only going to lift once this week, even if it screws up your whole block, you know, that's too bad. That's what you're going to do. You're going to give up your lifts that week so that they can play well on the weekends. Or, you know, you have the occasional, well, you're not going to squat or you're not going to clean my athletes. You know, we're, we're not doing any of that. So then you got to get creative and it kind of test you. What other ways can you or methods can you use to create power and to create strength? Um, that's been, you know, there's, there's certain, certainly times where it's frustrating, but I also think it makes you a better coach yeah. to be able to compromise and, and adjust with all that. And then, you know, there's uh, our generation. Obviously, I'm in this generation, yep. um, Generation Y, but our, the work ethic has changed over time. And so you have to find a way to really be able to coach your athletes and to relate to your athletes. And I think a lot of people just assume that because they're college athletes, they come in and they work hard and they leave. Yeah. But that's not it at all. Um, you, you certainly have some that do come in and do their work and, and move on. But there's a lot of motivation factors and, and relating to your student athletes so that they'll work for you rather than the authoritative role of making them do something. Um, so that would be a big challenge, I would say, as well. Yeah. yeah. Like I can remember the first time, you know, I remember in middle school, high school, I was kind of just a nerd and, you know, I'd sit in class and write programs for like myself. And it's always a, a huge gap when you write your first program and you actually do it with a team. Like, yeah, oh, I didn't think about these considerations or equipment or space or how it's much time it transitions from exercise to exercise. So all those things are just a huge thing. Like you said, head coaches can be a pain in your ass, but a lot of times they're, especially at the higher levels, those guys are a lot of times your boss. So, you have to kind of mm -hmm. do what they say. And I know young coaches, that's kind of a challenge. Like, hey, we're not going to clean today. You can't let your athletes clean or squat. And for some coaches, it was like, holy crap, what do you do now? You have to be able to adjust. And same thing where I'm at in the college setting is there's certain equipment that we don't have at our, our weight room and or mm -hmm. my head coach, uh, head strength coach, doesn't want certain equipment used in a certain way. So while my private sector, my, my business, I can do whatever the hell I want really. Mm -hmm. In the weight room, there's I have a lot, yeah, like you said, handcuffed in terms of what I'm able to do with the equipment available or how they want it used. Or like you said, at, I'm at the Division three level. We have 10, 10 racks. I might have 12 athletes in there. And then there might be a football lift going on as well where they're going to take priority and take eight of them. So I have, you know, two racks for 12 athletes. How do you adjust to that situation on the fly or tweak your program? So Absolutely. a lot of that stuff, yeah, like you said, there's a, there's a learning curve. You, you don't learn that in school. And it's just, uh, I know a lot of young coaches think we read a book and you think about this program on paper and then you actually apply it. There's a large gap in that application. Um, right. And it's, it's good to get your hands dirty and experience that as quick as possible. Definitely. Yeah. Like you said on the fly, you know, we'll get, there's some mornings we'll have four or five teams training at the same time. Yeah. And we split up the platforms and we've got four sets of dumbbells from five pounds to 150. So we had the equipment, but it's, you know, if I might have certain things paired in a certain way and then you have athletes running over to grab the dumbbells for it and realize that two of the other teams are doing the same thing. So what's a different single leg movement that I can switch to on the fly? Yep. And I think that's big time in developing yourself as a coach yeah. and your repertoire. Yeah, yeah. So to, guy, walk us through what a typical training session is for, uh, say, your tennis squad. What, what, what do you, from start to finish, kind of what, what's, what's a typical session look like? So – Typically, my tennis teams, both men's and women, come in after practice yeah. um, or a conditioning segment. So my men's typically condition in the morning, and then they'll come in and lift. Women will come in in the afternoon after practices. So they're already warm, you know, got a good sweat going. So we'll do some sort of mobility or uh, and or activation exercises, get them more in the lifting zone, lifting uh, mentality. And then we'll head to the platform. So we lift three days a week. And probably one day a week, we'll head right to the platform and we'll hit an explosive movement. We clean um, or I clean with my tennis athletes. Otherwise, we'll hit some kettlebell swings, some sort of med ball work, some sort of explosive movement. Then we're going to hit our lower body strength. Uh, we back squat, we front squat. And then after that, I'll usually try and hit a single leg movement or two yep. and a hip dominant movement. And then I just rotate push pull between the upper body. Um, there's only one day where we bench press that's in the middle of the week 
but otherwise, and that's dumbbell bench press, bench press, but otherwise it's a upper body push pull between horizontal and verticals. And I can just go back and forth and uh, I pair those exercises with some different uh, stability or mobility exercises or some shoulder uh, work as well. And so it's usually about a 45 minute lift, hit that explosive movement, hit that strength movement. And then after that, we're rolling through a push pull stuff. Now let's say they, they come in wherever sport comes in without being warm before they got in there. Are you guys warming up in the weight room or is there a track or a field house attached? How do you guys go about your warm up if the team's coming in cold? So we have a 40 yard track that's three lanes um, on the side of the weight room, okay. which when the weight room was built, the track was there for like speed and agility training. But now we have an indoor football facility, 120 yards of turf that also has a track that goes around it. And so we kind of split time between the indoor facility and the track and the weight room. Is that connected so to the weight bigger room? Teams, they is that What's indoor that? facility connected to the weight room? Yeah, there's a hallway between the two. Okay, okay. And so, uh, like our bigger teams, you know, our football, our basketballs, our wrestling, they'll go right into the indoor and we'll use the turf in there to go okay. through a dynamic flex and, and everything and then come in to hit on the platforms. But with my tennis teams, we'll foam roll on the track, um, go through a quick dynamic flex, do some activation, and then we'll roll onto the platform. So those mornings where we have four or five teams, there will be – two or three in the indoor and a couple of the smaller teams warming up on the track real briefly. And then, you know, everybody's rolling. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I know we've talked about this in the past, but you know, technology and monitoring and that kind of stuff is kind of the up and up in our field. And I know you're trying to get a, a grasp or some work on it because it seems, that seems to be a prerequisite now in a lot of jobs is having experience in some sort of sports science application. So what are some things that you're working on right now? I know you're doing a couple of things with the team and I know, uh, up there, they're giving you some more responsibility with monitoring sleep and nutrition and questionnaires. So what are some things that you're doing? Yeah. Um, so this winter, we started implementing with football uh, daily performance indicator log is what we call it. And so the guys come in and it's posted on the glass, either outside our office. So they literally step off the scale in the morning and go right over and fill it out. Or, you know, we'll, I guess what I'm getting at is it's posted every morning in a spot where as soon as they weigh in, they're going to fill it out. And what it has is the hours of sleep they got last night and then the quality of sleep ranked on one to five, um, their mood ranked one to five, their daily nutrition ranked one to five, and then their energy level ranked one to five. And so they'll go through and they'll fill that out. And I'll put it in the computer after the lift. And we'll, uh, we found a lot of trends as far as, you know, lack of sleep or increased sleep and how the guys perform but then we've also think that it's been big time for us and how we can relate to our athletes we had some instances this winter and in, in summer where guys came in and their moods were low or their energy level was low and and then you find out they had a death in their family or a family friend who got sick or things like that and so being able to to understand there's more stressors in their life than just what we give them in the weight room and on the field of play and then uh we don't make a ton or we haven't gotten to the point yet where we make a ton of uh, changes and modifications to that day's lift. Yep. But occasionally we will see like, Hey, this guy got two hours of sleep. We go and talk to him and it turns out that he had gone home for the weekend and he didn't drive back till Sunday night at midnight and only got two hours of sleep. So then now, you know, will you come back in four or five hours, go sleep for a while, then come back and get a lift. Okay. Yep. And um, so we've, we've started to make a few modifications right away, but there's still, more that we could probably do with it. Um, we don't have the biggest budget at NIU. The state of Illinois doesn't do us any favors right now either. And so I personally have a heart rate monitor that we've kind of been screwing around with a little bit and with some of our conditioning stuff on myself and um, our director of Olympic sports. And so that's been kind of fun. And I think you need experience with that in order to someday you know, get a job. And then we've also just purchased a handful of bar senses yeah. uh, that'll measure bar speed. And so we have the apps for that and we're in the process of purchasing all the, you know, the iPads and everything else that we need um, so that we can start to implement those a little bit. We used to have some Tendo units, um, but they were like the original version yeah. Oh, yeah. of Tendo units. And so they're all starting to crap out on us now. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had a chance to play around with the bar sensei yet? Uh, just a little bit. Um, is that honestly, the one that got, goes on the bar, right? It's not like a, like the push yeah. that goes on your wrist. Right. No, these ones are actually attached to the bar and then okay. feeds right into your iPad or iPhone. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, this year at the, our, our clinic, our, our lead performance clinic, you spoke about kind of shoulder care, arm care for, for overhead athletes and considerations to, uh, to take when training these, this population. So give us a little overview of how you approach this with your tennis athletes, obviously them being overhead athletes or some other things that you're doing that may be um, specific to kind of overhead population. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this stuff is what I learned at Stanford. Uh, Coach Shirley and his staff do an excellent job with their shoulder care and their um, stability uh, movements. And so tennis, obviously another overhead sport. And my goal is to train them to use their shoulder cuff muscles rather than overcompensating with their other muscles and hopefully preventing overuse injuries of swings and whatnot. It's obviously not a contact sport where you have to worry about those kind of injuries as well. But we have, uh, we do a lot of different internal external rotations with bands and then we have little like two to three pound med balls and we go through some different um, throws or drops with those working on eccentric strength um, within those shoulder cuff muscles and then the goal, I guess just the general goal is their posture. We, you know, right now I'm looking at myself on the camera and my shoulders are rounded we sit at our desk all day typing and we're around on our shoulders. They sit at their desk and they're typing their heads down. And so they just continue to anteriorly tilt their upper body. And so we really focus on pulling your scaps back, having a big chest, and then going through the movements to focus on, you know, the primary movers actually being the primary movers rather than overcompensating. Yeah. Um, are you doing any kind of assessments or, uh, or breaking down evals of the those athletes and – Anything that you may or may not be omitting or progressing differently in the weight room, say with them, you would with a football linebacker or something like that? I have not. Uh, Zach, our director of Olympic sports, does a really good job with that. And he does that with his baseball um, and softball athletes. I have not done very many um, evaluations of that sort with my tennis athletes right now. Okay. Okay. Any, anything you're doing, is it just in terms of lifting, are you, are you doing maybe – going to neutral grip with all your presses or pulls? Are you trying to, do you have safety squat bars front? Are you going more front squat versus back squat, et cetera, et cetera, or grip? So, like um, with my tennis athletes, all of our presses are with dumbbells. And then when we do our pull-ups or our uh, pull-downs, it's all neutral grip. Um, we do have safety squat bars. I only have one tennis athlete that's on there, but then we do a lot of front squatting. Um, and that's also part of, partially because of our teaching progression. You know, I teach the front squat before I teach the back squat. Yep. But it also helps with their shoulder care as well. Um, so those would be my modifications. Like I said earlier, we're always dumbbell benching. I don't have them on a barbell yep. bench. That goes along with presses. But overall, we've been in my brief time here. But from what I understand, in the last three to four years, they haven't had any shoulder injuries with their tennis players. Very minimal um, in the last couple of years of baseball and softball as well. So we hope to continue those trends by using our um, shoulder, shoulder cuff exercises. Right. Are you guys doing the same type of work with your quarterbacks in football? Are they doing a little bit differently than the rest of the uh, position players? Yeah, so they go through their normal lift and we modify. They don't, you know, they aren't going to barbell snatch like a lot of our guys do. Uh, at times we'll even, we won't clean our quarterbacks. And so then they go through the lift and they finish the day with Zach and he takes them through some of our shoulder exercises that he does with um, baseball and softball or that I do with men's women's tennis. And so he'll pair them in every once in a while during the lift, but primarily it's at the end of the lift, they go with Zach and go through some shoulder care uh, work. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Uh, kind of our last five questions here that we'll always ask you. So number one, you know, what do you see as a trend or prediction for the future of, say, the strength and conditioning profession? What, what, what kind of trends or just anything you see as developing or us working towards as a field? Anything that you think that you can predict that young coaches or even current coaches need to get on board with or something that's going to kind of be the face or the environment of our field in, five, say, five to ten years? I certainly think the sports science aspect is going to continue to grow. Um, athlete monitoring and all that technology and how you can implement a GPS or a heart rate um, – I think that's going to continue to grow. And so I don't know education wise how that's going to affect things, but I think that you're going to have to understand a lot more physiology. And then I think that strength coaches are going to 
going to continue to be molded into, um, I guess you'd say like PTs or athletic trainers where they're more, more involved in the rehab process than in the past. And, uh, I could see that continue to grow, which goes along with knowing more of the physiology and, and the rehab protocols. Um, those would be my two big trends, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I, as I look at strength and conditioning coaches, and that's already begun in a sense is that I think you have to align yourself. You're going to be like aligned in three different fields. Like you said, you're going to be more of that athletic trainer or PT side. We're going to be more of that return to sport rehab. So you can kind of mold that in one, or they're going to be like a sports scientist or a technology type guy. So you can implement those tools within your strength and conditioning program. Or I think, like you said, the other one would be, they'll start to be more of a, a sport coach. I mean, if you look at Iowa right now, with Doyle, obviously he's got, you know, making $600,000 a year, but Ferns came out and said that he considers him kind of his associate head coach. Like if he was gone, that he would consider Doyle. And so align yourself with that sport coach or kind of being someone that can look at with position coaches or the coach in that team and start to develop specific drills for, for uh, individual time or for practice, stuff like that, where you're kind of more of the expert and kind of the biomechanics of that sport. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's the, the old just squat, deadlift, clean bench. Your meathead is kind of diminishing a little bit. you got to start to expand into, I think, one of those three dimensions to really market yourself or be, you know, uh, put yourself out for a lot of jobs. I, I think that's a trend like you, you, you nail on the head there. So I know you're, you're a big reader, and I actually we just started a book club and I'm really enjoying the book you, uh, uh, you have us reading. Um, but uh, where are some three books that you've uh, – kind of change the way you coach or view kind of the coaching as a whole? Um, the first one that comes to mind is one that I read at the beginning of the summer. I, yeah, beginning of the summer. It's called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And they're two former Navy SEALs, and they currently um, co-own a company, and they go to Fortune 500 companies and athletic teams and teach their leadership qualities. And it was a really good book. Um, and it's cool because I kind of enjoy reading, uh, some of those like war stories and books by Navy SEALs about missions and stuff and just their mentality. But then, you know, they, they give you a point and then they'd explain how that point was used during their time in the Navy SEALs and they would describe a specific instance and then they'd come back and then they would describe how they've implemented that in the business world or in the coaching world. And so just talking about you know, basically owning up to what every single thing that you do, positive or negative, and then accepting responsibility and fixing it or making it better if it was a good choice. And so uh, just trying to take extreme ownership in everything I do. And my programming is, was that really the right thing to do at the time? No? Okay, well then here's what I need to do to adjust. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one that I read was Grit. And Grit was good because it just kind of reassured what I've always um, thought or believed, I guess, that you can – you can outwork what talents you're already given. You know, you might be predisposed to not be the smartest person in there, the most athletic person, but when it comes down to it, if you've got the mindset and the heart, then you can still get the job done. And so uh, working through whatever gets put in your way yep. and um, getting to where you want to be. And then to build off of that, I read Obstacles the Way by Ryan Holiday, and that's the same kind of thing. Um, just because there's an obstacle there doesn't mean you should you should go a different path. Getting over that obstacle is going to help make you stronger and help you uh, to success. Yeah, and you, then uh, you turn me on the holidays books. He, his his books are awesome. Yeah, ego is the enemy. Obstacle is the is the way. Those are two awesome books. Definitely. Yeah, I just finished uh, ego is the enemy last week or two weeks ago, and it, another really yeah. good book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those those would be my three right now. Now, for, for grit is Duckworth is she from Stanford I believe right she's done stuff there I don't know if she's uh, employed by Stanford or not but she's been involved in studies there yes yeah okay I was wondering if, if the football staff or some staff up there used her work or brought her in to the team at all not her um Dr. Sherry Ma okay. um who's you know, like a sleep expert yep that's one who she was at Stanford I think she's now at the University of San Francisco um but that would be the one doctor I can think of that they brought in and had that's done experiments and has written articles and books and whatnot. Okay. How about name a website or blog that you like to visit or recommend for coaches to, uh, to again, expand, not just knowledge and say strength and conditioning, but anything, like you said, uh, 
business, uh, just personal development, that kind of stuff. Anything you recommend? Um, strength, strength, power, speed with Derek Hansen's website. Yep. I think that's awesome. I think that one of the things I really need to improve on is my knowledge of speed training and conditioning and tempo runs and whatnot. And he's a great resource for all of that. I really like his stuff. And then um, Zach, our director of Olympic sports, he's a big Jim Windler and Mark Ribito fan. Yep. And so he's always sending me different articles that he reads in them. So I end up on their blogs quite a bit. And then uh, we both listen to podcasts and trade podcasts back and forth. And Entree Leadership, it's, uh, I think it's Dave Ramsey's podcast, but they have coaches on there all the time. Um, Angela Duckworth is on there. Tim Elmore, the author of Generation IY, is on there. So all kinds of good things as far as life, money, um, you know, coaching. And then a uh, new one that we stumbled upon is called Historic Performance Podcast. Yeah, it's a good one. They've got some, some good coaches on there and strength coaches on there. Um, with some good talks. Yeah, he, he does a really good job. Yeah. Um, awesome. Um, you guys, should you talk about Barston State? Any other kind of apps that you like to use in terms of whether coaching or personal life that you use in the weight room or something like that? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. We're, I don't know if you consider it an app, but we're trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out a way to use Google Drive. When we get these iPads for our Bar Sensei, part of it was we had to have multiple ways to use them. And so um, figuring out a way to send out our daily performance indicator log on there and have the guys fill it out and send it back. Um, so that, that'd be one thing, I guess, that I'm tooling around with. But I'm not a big app guy. You know, we'll, we'll film lifts, but we don't really use any fancy apps for that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, perfect. What is your favorite social media outlet to use, browse or connect with other coaches or people with? Uh, Twitter, right. definitely Twitter. Um, I go on there for motivational stuff, and then I love when guys share articles. Or occasionally you'll get into a, a dispute or a debate, I guess. Oh, yeah. you know, four or five strength coaches going on about their opinions and, and how they would train this or train that, and that's always entertaining. And, you know, I think I learned plenty out of that, oh, yeah. out of those conversations. Um, my boss, he always jokes about how, 20 years ago, there wasn't Twitter. So that's why he doesn't know certain yeah. things now because he didn't have, he didn't just go to Twitter and read through things. Um, and how much easier we have it now with these social media outlets. Oh, yeah. And it's crazy because they were invented for, you know, just regular social interaction, but you can still use them for education too. Perfect. What's your, what's your Twitter ha handle? Your Twitter uh, name? Jacob Ricketts 36, okay. I believe. Perfect. And then I actually, I run our NIU strength page as well. Actually, Jacob Ricketts 34 okay. is my Twitter handle. And then NIU underscore strength is um, our strength page's Twitter handle. You do a good job with that. Just, I started following you guys like a month ago. And I appreciate it. You do a, put up some really good articles. And you, do your athletes follow that stuff? They, you think they accepted that? They do. Um, we've got a good portion of them follow it, and they have fun with it. You know, yeah. this summer, a couple of big conditioning days, they were tweeting at us and, you know, putting up memes and whatnot, which is yeah. good because – now I know when I do post important stuff that they're probably going to at least glance at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've shared some different things as far as fruits and vegetables. And, like, one time it was, you know, did you know that these fruits contain more than 80% water or something like that? Yeah. And, like, three or four guys came up to me the next day. And, I didn't know watermelon had so much water in it. Or I didn't know that, you know, green beans did this. And so it's, it's reassuring to know that they do pay a little bit of attention to it. Yeah, I'm always surprised, too, and – when I post them on Twitter or even Instagram or whatnot, or Facebook, and the next day an athlete come in, hey, I read that article you wrote or that article that you linked to. That was pretty cool. I'm like, oh my, you guys are actually reading this? Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Oh. It, definitely yeah. a nice pat on the back. Yeah, and then, you know, being in private industry, I think those athletes, they love to see themselves. It's, it's cool for them to have a, a video on Instagram or a picture on Instagram or you tweet at them, say, nice job in the game last night. So that's always uh, – like you said, talking about your gener generation IY is that that's kind of how they connect and how they kind of relate and build some of that rapport and relationship with them. So it's it, like you said, it's, it's a huge, huge tool for coaches now that honestly, you, if you're not really on it right now, you're probably behind the game or, or you're losing some aspects that you could be gained. Yeah. From. Well, perfect. Jacob, the, Definitely. That's all I got for today. So um, um, thanks for your time and hopefully the listeners learned something.